Our scripture reading this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 19. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Duane. The end of verse 19 says, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Through which we draw near to God. Do do you feel like you are drawing near to God? Or this morning, do you feel more distant from God? Rather than feeling like you draw near to God, do you feel more like you have limited access to God in your, in your experience? I mean, we often don't come to God in prayer, in fellowship, because we don't feel close to God. We don't feel intimate with God. And this, this book was written to to Christians who were Hebrew Christians. Their faith originally was rooted in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament Jewish people lived with limited access to God. Now, for them, certainly, access to God was a high priority. It was a a prized achievement. It was the highest good for them to have access to God because if they had access to God, that meant they had right relationship with God. If they had access to God, that means they would have had acceptance before God or forgiveness from God. And but yet they they had limited access. That's why so many Psalms kind of have this sense of longing. If you read through the Psalms or like Psalm 42, one in particular may be familiar as the deer pants for flowing streams of water. So my soul longs for you, right? There's this longing because they wanted God's presence, but there was limited access because for them, the only way they could have access to God was through a priest, someone who would go into the tabernacle, right? They'd set up the tabernacle or the temple when the temple was built. The only person who could go to the place where God was to talk with God was the priest. And he had to go through, uh, you know, the ritual. He had to go cleansing himself to go. He was the only one that went. So someone went for them. So there was kind of right relationship with God because they would, they would make sacrifices so that there could be forgiveness of sins, but yet there wasn't this intimacy with God. So how does a person get close to God? Well, this passage shows us how we can have intimacy with God. It shows us that we can have intimacy with God through Jesus Christ. 
Jesus is the one that provides intimacy with God with us. He provides the intimacy that we long to have, that, we, that seems elusive at times for us. So this morning we're going to look at four truths that help us to know that we aren't distant from God, rather that we can have intimacy with God. So the first truth is this. Jesus has the power and privilege to give us intimacy with God. Look at verse 11. It says, now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? So it starts with, now, if perfection. So perfection is needed to have relationship with God, because God's perfect in every way. He's holy. If you enter in his presence and you aren't perfect, uh, you're, you're just done. You're dead. You're going to be just, you can't enter his presence without being perfect. And we know that perfection is not attainable by human means. The, the priest could go and offer sacrifices for the sins of the people, but they didn't make the people perfect. They didn't make the people perfect so that they could just go freely. So priests are needed, and Jesus is a priest after this Melchizedek that we learned about three weeks ago when we were in the first part of chapter seven. We learned about Melchizedek being this, uh, this unique individual, that, a little bit written about him in the scriptures, but yet he was a priest and he was a king. Remember, you know, priests aren't kings, kings aren't priests. They have different roles, different functions, different duties, but yet this guy Melchizedek was both. And Jesus is both. So because Jesus is priest and king, because he's king, he has the power to accomplish anything. He has the power to accomplish relationship with God, power to accomplish anything that needs done in your life. But he also has privileged access because he's a priest. He goes before the Father. He goes before the Father on our behalf. So it's Jesus who brings us close to God. Now, we're tempted to not draw near because functionally we may believe this truth about Christ, but functionally we, we don't because we, we tend to not come based on, on our daily experience. We, we are hindered to draw near because we functionally feel coming to God is dependent on us. You've experienced this. Right? I, I just sinned against my friend or my child or my spouse. I, I can't go to the Lord right now. I mean, I've, I've got to get that figured out because he's not happy with me right now. So we functionally, like, well, it's based on us that, that I'm going. That's, that's kind of what is functionally happening in that moment. I, I can't go. But you, you don't go because of you. Our relationship with God doesn't depend on us. Our relationship with God depends on Christ. It, it depends on his life. Look at verse 16. So, so verse 15, it says, it says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, meaning like he didn't become a priest because he was in the line of the Levites. No, he becomes a priest by the power of an indestructible life. The power of an indestructible life. That doesn't mean that Jesus didn't die. We, we, we know that that he died, but what that means is that the death could not hold him. His death could not hold him. Death didn't hold Jesus in the grave, indestructible, because his death paid the penalty for sins, and so nothing could hold him there. Like, that had been, it had been paid for. The debt had been paid for. The punishment had been, had been taken, and so, so there's nothing that could keep him there. He'd, he'd paid for it. His death was followed by a resurrection, so it's, it's by his life that we have access. Author Kent Hughes said this, Jesus is our great high priest because of the quality of his life. His, he is eternal, the alpha 
and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. His eternity was not suspended when for 33 years he took on a temporal existence. In human form, he experienced all that is common to man, everything, even death. He, he laid down his life. He said, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. He rose by the virtue of his indestructible life, and he is now eternally our priest. Jesus is the one that has the power and the privilege to give us access. You don't have to start with you. You don't have to start with your experience, what you need to do. You start with what Christ has done. But then look in verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. We don't go through anyone else. If you want to go and meet a president of a company, there's a process that you have to go through. You can't just walk through the door. Usually it starts with the receptionist, if there's even one anymore, right? Oftentimes it's the virtual or there's no one there. The door's locked. You can't go, but you have to go through someone. And then often you, to see the president, you have to know someone who knows them if you don't already know them. There, there's a way they have to go. But if you're the son or the daughter of the president, you've got his cell phone number on speed dial. Right? You, you can have access whenever you want. You can go whenever you want. And we go because of Christ, not simply because we know him. It's not that we're just friends with the son of the president. We're not just friends with the son of God so we can go. But the blood of Jesus makes us part of the family so we can go. The, the better hope is introduced. We, we are now part of of the family, and we can go. We can go into the presence of God. We have that which the Old Testament saints didn't have, and we have that because of Christ. So I want to ask you, are, are you part of the family this morning? Have you trusted in Jesus? Do you have a longing to be before God you want to be, and you can be, because all you have to do is come to Jesus humbly this morning and ask for the forgiveness of your sins, and he will forgive you of your sins, and you'll become part of the family. And I encourage you not to leave here this morning without having that conversation with God. He only has the power and privilege to give us access. And we don't just know that, son. We, we've been part of the family, and Jesus guarantees our access to God. That's the second truth. Jesus guarantees our access. Look at your Bibles at verse 20. It says, And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Remember we talked about oaths a little bit a few weeks ago. God didn't have to make an oath. His word, when he says his word, it's always true. When God says it, you can know it's going to happen. It's absolutely true. God's word is the standard of truth. But for our benefit, he then makes the oath. And, and so he, he wants us to know it's sure. And he has sworn. It says in verse 21, the Lord has sworn. Now that word has kind of become lost on us. Like, I swear. At one time in our Western culture, someone's word was their bond. When they gave you their word, it was going to happen. There wasn't the need for contracts and lawyers. If someone extended their hand to you and gave a handshake, 
They were swearing that would be done, and it was, it was as sure and, and even more sure than any contract that we experience in our day and age. So when we read that, kind of, it's, it's a little bit lost in us. Well, like, well, someone swear. I hear people go, I swear, and it, it doesn't really mean something. So in an age of broken promises, we have to understand that God's, God's word is his bond. So when he swears, it happens. We're tempted to think that God wavers like we do. When we think about God, we, we think he might, he might waver like, you know, wishy-washy is based on emotions or how I feel at that moment. You know, as parents, we can be tempted sometimes to respond to our children based on how we feel in the moment or if they've done what we think that they've done before we ask questions and we can respond, you know, and God's not like us. God's not like us. He's not wishy-washy. It says in verse 21, it says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. He will not change his mind. So he he has put Jesus in this place. And, And it's not changing. It's not moving. It wasn't, it wasn't just a great idea one time and, and, and it's kind of get fallen out of favor. Because Jesus is the guarantor. Look at verse 22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. God was intentional when he sent his son. God, God didn't go, Oh no, I can't believe this happened. I've got to come up with another plan. God was very intentional to put forth his son, and he put forth his son as a guarantor. What's, what's a guarantor? Oftentimes we can think about guarantor when you think about maybe getting a loan or having a line of credit of some kind. You need a guarantor because the bank wants to make sure they know who they can go after if the bills aren't being paid. Right? They, want, they want to make sure they get their money. They want to make sure this debt is paid for. So maybe you found yourself in a place at some point in your life where either you maybe didn't have good credit or you didn't have any credit because you're young. And so you needed a parent or someone who had resources to be a guarantor because the bank was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give them anything. I'm not going to give a debt to them. But if they have a debt, I want to make sure it gets paid. Jesus is the guarantor for us. He's the guarantor. His life paves the way to get access. It doesn't matter if you can't measure up because because you can't measure up. We sometimes act and we, we stress like, like the way that many can stress when they, they have a debt that, that has to be paid and they can't figure out how to pay it. And, and anxiety starts to happen. You start to stress over not being able to pay that debt. But then we kind, of, we kind of bring that behavior into our relationship with God. And we can be like, no, I've got to, I've got to do something. I've got to get that paid for. I've got to, I, I, you know, I, I, God's not going to like it. Like the, the bill collector's going to come and knock on my door. We don't have to experience any of that because we have a guarantor who is perfect. When when, when a perfect life is needed, there's there's one that has been lived. When when you need to be aware that forgiveness is, is needed, forgiveness has been extended. The debt has been paid. So you can go any time because you have a guarantor. You don't have to look at how you feel in the moment. You don't have to look at what you've done this last week. You don't have to consider your entire life. You just have to go because we have a guarantor and that guarantor intercedes for us. Truth number three is Jesus' intercession for us is unceasing. Let's keep going on in the text. Look at verse 23. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. We needed tons of priests because they died, 
right? They, they lived a certain amount of years, and then they died, and then they needed another one, and then they needed another one. But he, verse 24, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Jesus continues forever. He doesn't, he's not going to die. He's been risen from the dead, and he's not going to die. We don't have to wonder, will he get reelected? This has become more real in recent day. Will, will our elected official live his whole life before, before the end of his term? We don't know. That, we don't ever wonder that with Jesus. He lives forever. We're not hindered to come over limitations because he has no limitations because he continues forever. Therefore, and if you look at verse 25, it says, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost. What does that uttermost mean? It means he's able to save us completely, absolutely, totally. It means even more so, like the, the, the word has kind of a nuance to it that it doesn't allow for the possibility of our supplementing our salvation by doing some good. It's not like, well, he can save the other most, but then I need to do a little bit more to kind of add to it. No, like none of that is needed. He, he does it all. No matter where you go, no matter what you have done, whether that's in the distant past or recent past or this morning before you came to our time of fellowship here, he is not hindered in his ability to save you and secure you in your place. He's able to save us completely. So no matter how many times you stumble and fall, Christ has saved you completely. And look at the second half of this verse. It says, so he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. I want to read that again. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. As Christians, we, we know that Jesus died for our sins. We know that he's seated at God's right hand. And oftentimes we think about Jesus just like parking it there. Like he did the victory. Like it's done. He's seated on the throne. He's just, you know, someone's bringing him some grapes while he's just sitting there. He's just waiting for God to send him back, right? He's just waiting because he doesn't know when he's coming back. So that, that's what Jesus is doing. Yes, Jesus won the victory at the cross, but Jesus is actively involved in your life right now because he is interceding for you. It says he lives to make intercession for them. He, he's praying unceasingly. He's going to the Father. Even when we don't go, he goes. Even when we cut it short because we're just, it's the, the day's gonna be busy, it's, it's tired. Even when we cut it short because as we're praying on our knees, all of a sudden we realize time has passed because we've fallen asleep. Jesus doesn't. He's praying for you continually. What a reason for us to come to, into his presence when we don't feel close because he's continually going. He's not growing weary. I grow weary. I miss some days to have intimacy with God. I can fall asleep when I'm praying, but Jesus does not grow weary. One theologian said, Jesus' contact with the Father is unbroken. His intercession is never ending. Day by day, hour by hour, year by year, millennium by millennium, Christ prays for us. How does he intercede for us? He, along with the Holy Spirit, takes our feeble prayers, cleans them up, enables them, and presents them to the Father. A, uh, a great fourth century preacher who I can't pronounce his name, he, he provided a helpful analogy. This is what he said. He said, a young boy whose father was away on a trip 
wanted to present his father with something that would please him. His mother sent him to the garden to gather a bouquet of flowers. You've got this image, right? You've seen children, whether they're your own or others, you know, they want to come and they want to bring something special, right? So the little boy gathered a sorry bouquet of weeds as well as flowers. Some of you moms have received that on Mother's Day. You're just hopeful that the nice flowers didn't come from the neighbor's yard, right? But, but it comes, and it's kind of rattered and tattered and torn, right? So the little boy comes. That's the picture. But when his father returned home, he was presented with a beautifully arranged bouquet. For the mother had intervened, removing all of the weeds. So you don't have to have your prayers all refined and nice. You don't have to have a, a booming voice when you pray because it's going to be, then the Lord is going to hear me if I, if I pray like this. When you're in a prayer time with other friends, you don't have to have your words be perfectly articulated because they're not the ones that need to hear what you're saying. You can go with whatever you have and Jesus intercedes. It gets perfectly to the Father and then it comes perfectly with the answer that the Lord, that, that, that is needed. So you don't, have, you don't have to kind of get yourself together. You don't have to wait till, maybe, maybe if I'm a little bit more mature in the faith, then I'll go to the prayer meeting and pray with other people. Or, you know, I just struggle. I'm just not going to pray because I just struggle with praying because it's just not, he doesn't want that. He wants that bouquet, right? You may have seen that. You may have gotten it where the, where the kid comes to you with, with this thing that to them is special, and, and it looks like it's just a mess, whether it's been the Cheerios that they held in their hand, that they open them up, and you're like, ah, oh, and you take it, and you smile. Like, that, we come with that. You come with that. You come with whatever. Because he's interceding for us. Don't be hindered by what you think you're bringing. Because he intercedes for us. You don't need a perfect prayer list. You don't need to be eloquent. You don't need to understand doctrine and theology. Don't worry about praying heretical prayers. God knows your heart. And Jesus is interceding. Just come because he lives to make intercession for us. He lives to make intercession. It says to those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And know this, Jesus, Jesus prayed for you before he went to the cross. If you, if you were around when we were in John 17, you can leave your finger here, in, and if you want to turn to John 17, you can, but I'm just going to read verse 9. So this is the prayer that Jesus prays in the garden. He's been with his disciples. He's about ready to go to the cross, and he's praying, and he says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I believe Jesus wasn't just praying for those disciples, but I know that God gave him all the saints, those that would trust in him those that had believed in the hope of him in the past but before he came and those that would trust in him. And so he prays for them. And these are some of the things he prays. He, in verse 11, he prays uh, that they would persevere. In verse 15, he prays for protection from the evil one. In verse 17, he prays that, that, that it, those loved ones would be sanctified so that we can be on mission. In verse 21, he prays for unity with one another. In verse 24, he prays that we would see his glory. Like, that's just in that prayer. That's loaded enough. The, Jesus prayed that. But now, he didn't just stop there. He always lives to make intercession for us. So, so know that truth. His prayers are unceasing. And as, you, as you're 
as you come and you feel more aware of your imperfections, know this. This is truth number four. Jesus is flawless, so you don't have to be. We think we have to have it all together. Like, we, we gather as saints. Like, there's this thing in the back of our mind, I gotta make sure that everything's good. When people ask, we need to be like, praise the Lord, everything's awesome. No, we don't have to be perfect, particularly when we come before him. Be, it, perfection is the way to have right relationship with God. We talked about that a little bit earlier. That is true. But perfection is not attainable through human means. Look at verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, but look at the description of him. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. His character is unflawed. There is no flaw in his character. The media won't find something dastardly in his past. There, there won't be anything that they can come up with unless it's a bold-faced lie because his character is flawless. He's innocent, which means he's blameless. He's literally without evil. He's unstained, which means he's pure. He walked through every temptation this world has to offer. The muck and the mire and the struggle. And he did it without sin. And so in that way, he's separated. Not to be distant from us, but because he's just separated because of who he is. And he's then exalted and triumphant. He is flawless. Now, remember what priests had to do in the Old Testament? They had to go before, before they atoned for the sins of the people and made those sacrifices. They had to go and cleanse themselves. It was quite the ritual. They had to cleanse themselves because they were sinners, so they had to take the time to do that. Then they would go and atone for the sins of the people, and so they regularly had to do that. That's what they were doing. That's, that's, that's what they had to do. But this is what Jesus did. He has no need, like those high priests in verse 27, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. He did it once for all. So Jesus doesn't need to be busy in the way that the priests, the Old Testament priests were, because they spent all their time cleansing their sin and then going to cleanse the sins of others. Cleansing their sin, going to cleanse the sins of others. Jesus did that once for all. He didn't go to cleanse his sin because he was perfect. He went to exchange with us his perfect life for our imperfect life, and he cleansed our sins, and he did it once. So it is done. That has been paid for. So what does this priest do with his time? He intercedes for us. That's what he does with his time. He intercedes for us as he waits to return to bring us to himself. He's perfect forever. It says, for the law appoints men in their weakness, in verse 28, as high priest, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Nothing can change his perfection. Nothing is going to come. There's no temptation. There's, there's nothing. Once for all. He's flawless. So you can get off the treadmill of trying to attain to perfection because it's already been attained and your sins have been atoned and you can go to the Father as if you are perfect because you go through Christ. You go through Christ. So if you've trusted in Christ, if you want to be close to God, know Jesus has already brought you close. Intimacy with God has already been achieved. It's not something you have to achieve. And we don't, we, we often can do things based on what we feel, but we don't come 
based on what we feel. We come based on what is real. And what is real is that Jesus is the priest king that gives us intimacy with God. Jesus is flawless, so you don't have to be. Jesus guarantees our access to God. And Jesus' intercession for us is unceasing. So come to him. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for the right time, the perfect time. You can actually come to him right now.